Hey guys, long time no see. I'm sorry about that, but I'm back. I just got in a bad habit of just not filming with everything going on in my life, but I'm back. And so I need to start the month with sharing what books I read this past month in February, uh, because you know this is a homeschool channel and I believe that educating yourself is a big part of homeschooling. You should continue your own education beyond your children. And a big part of that is reading books, obviously. And I feel like it was a good variety of books this time around, and we're about to get into those books right now. First, I do want to say if you are into homeschooling content, make sure you hit the subscribe button. This channel is all about homeschooling, and you'll find a lot to do with that here on this channel. Also, the thumbs up lets me know that you enjoy these monthly book videos, so I know to make more of them in the future for you. Okay, February was full of really great books. Let's get into it. First and foremost, if you're new here, just in case you don't know, I tend to do ebooks uh, through Kindle or audiobooks. I'm not really like a physical book person just because I don't like a ton of books taking up space in my house. I feel like there's enough things taking up space here. <laughs> so that's why you won't see me holding any books. But let's go ahead and talk about what books I read this month. February, not this month, it's March, February. All right, so the very first book I read this month, just pulling up the title here, it was The Brave Learner, Finding Everyday Magic in Homeschool by Julie Bogart. Now I, on Goodreads, gave this book a four out of five. So first let's talk about what the book's about. This book is a, all about homeschooling. It's about a mother's experience with homeschooling and she prefers a homeschooling that doesn't feel very um, cold and rigid with routine and a lot of books and um, that, you know, like structured style of learning. This is a mom who prefers everything to be explorative learning and a lot of unschooling and it's really great it has a lot of really great nuggets in the book now the only thing about this book that made it harder for me to read and it took quite some time to be honest took a few months to read this book i kept putting it down was the way it's written it's almost like jumbled up thoughts put down uh very unstructured <laughs> granted you're never lost in a book but it kind of just jumps from subject to subject there's no like correlation with how you read it which is how my brain prefers things so it was tough to get through because I kept putting it down just because it felt very chaotic to read. But if that doesn't bother you, if you can look past the chaos in the book, it is a really great book with a lot of little great um, pieces of information and ideas and attitudes towards homeschool. So I do recommend it. Just know it's very jumpy. It's a very jumpy book. So that's why I got a four out of five. Yes, especially for you moms who either love to be creative and unstructured or are craving to do that type of learning and to be less um, scheduled and rigid, pick up this book. All right, the next book that I read is called White Awake. And um, well, the whole title is White Awake, an honest look at what it means to be white, written by Daniel Hill. Now, this is a book regarding race and racial issues, but specifically the book talks about white privilege. I, I'm going to be very honest. I tend to be um, skeptic about racial books written by Caucasian people. Okay, I'm Caucasian and I just I feel like because white privilege is a thing, I find it hard to believe that um, white people can write a book about racism or white privilege in the sense that we will always be blind to things about our own privilege and I don't know if we can ever master white privilege fully because of that reason. Just being honest that is my own personal opinion. However I will say this book was really great. I would highly recommend it for every white person or even non-white person, whatever. Anybody could read this, honestly. It puts a lot of things into perspective. Now, there are things in there that obviously I understood before reading the book as I have been on the journey of understanding racism, white privilege, all these things for a while now, but there were still things in there that I had never thought of in the way that he put it. And it was a really great book to just open up my eyes even more. And another great thing about this is it's a biblically based book. So he's he's speaking about racism and white privilege from a biblical perspective. And it actually could be used as a Bible study book, to be honest, if you're wanting to you or your church um, look more into this subject, this is a great book to look at. So I do highly recommend it. He has so much good information in it. And I gave this book a five out of five. And uh, it was one of the best books I've read, to be honest. So I highly recommend it. Granted, it's only what through February that I'm giving you these reviews at this point, but it is one of the top books of the year so far. Okay, the next book. <laughs> Let's talk about my opinion on this one. A very well-known book called The One Thing 
the surprisingly simple truth behind, let's see the whole title here, uh, Extraordinary Results. This was written by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan, or with Jay Papasan. I don't know if I said those names right, but um, here's the thing. I have a very unpopular opinion about this book. I know that this book is very loved by so many entrepreneurs and uh, people in the productivity world. Like I know that this is a book that hits home for so many people, but it didn't work for me guys. I gave it a three out of five. And the only reason I got a three out of five is because the second half of the book saved it for me. The first half of the book, I give it a two. So for anybody who is unaware of what this book is about, uh, the one thing is a book essentially about um, entrepreneurs or productive people working towards a specific goal and to create an income around that goal, which is a great idea. There's nothing in this book that isn't good information. However, I do feel like it's not a book for stay at home moms <laughs> who have a sole job of taking care of their kids, especially if you have a spouse that works long hours like mine does. I'm often left to take care of everything in the household. It's just, you know, part of being the stay at home mom. And I just feel like this book can't relate to that specific set of people. And it kind of touches on that at the end of the book. Literally, it doesn't even talk about it till the end of the book. At the end of the book, it does say like, if you are a stay at home mom or like, a, I think it even mentions like single parent, those kind of things. They say, obviously you have to like switch around what they're saying. They say maybe trade time with someone else where one of you watches the kids and the other one watches another time so you both can be productive. It gives tips like that, but it's nothing huge given in that section. That That's my problem with it. It just, it feels like it's not written for parents whose sole job is to take care of kids, but have a desire to do other things as well. And that's why I really couldn't enjoy it. Is there great information in this book? Absolutely. Yes, there is. There are really great things in this book. I would even still recommend everybody read it. My opinion is not your opinion. You may fall in love with this book, even if you're in the same situation as me. I just feel like it's highly unlikely it'll be like the end all be all for a parent who is the sole provider for the most part. <laughs> and I say that lightly even with me because I'm not a single parent. I have a husband who provides the income um, and I provide the childcare. If you want to look at it as far as like whose role is what. So. Um, I could only imagine how much dif more difficult this book could be for a single parent. Um, but still, like I said, there's really great information in there and the book still gave me tiny nuggets that have actually pushed me to get things done and to be more productive. So like I said, I would still recommend it even though it wasn't my favorite book. I'm not crazy about it like many of the other entrepreneurs are. All right, we have three books left for the month of February. The next one is called The World According to Fannie Davis, My Mother's Life in the Detroit Numbers. Sorry for the little um, pauses there. So I have to click to get the full title of the book. This was written by Bridget M. Davis. Bridget is the daughter of Fannie and she wrote this memoir about her mother's life. The book was obviously a, written after her mother had passed. Listen, you guys, this is a five out of five stars book, okay? Now I am someone who would pick up a biography and I don't know why I don't pick up like memoirs more. Um, I guess I just pick up the more factual side of autobiographies and biographies, but this is changing my mind. I think I actually have a love for memoirs after reading this and it might be my new favorite genre. We'll see. That's saying a lot because like it's the only memoir I've read this year. So we'll see, okay? This book was wonderful. Now I was not aware of the numbers. I'm not a person who's in the gambling world, to be honest. I don't know much about gambling. I tried it one time and I hated it. It was the dumbest thing I ever did, honestly. I spent five bucks and one zero. So I was like, yeah, I'm over this. Never did it again. I'm just not a gambling person. So I've never had interest in understanding the history behind gambling. And so numbers, if you're not aware, was a, an illegal activity, I guess we'll put it. it. It was, it was illegal. And it was a lottery system before the lottery system was a thing. It was a system used by multitudes of people different from different backgrounds. But according to the book, it was very heavy in the African-American community to use um, the lottery system that was illegal called numbers. If you want to know more about it, look into it because I can't just sit here and explain it all. But that's what it's about. It's about a woman who wanted more for her family and she created more for her family by becoming a numbers runner and eventually a banker for the numbers. She's a woman who really survived off of um, 
it feels like a lot of luck like you know some people just they have the right position in life they always seem to be at the right time at the right place and always have the right things happen to them she's one of those people now the argument in the book is that she almost like a karma or you reap what you sow type of attitude where she was so benevolent and good to people that in return it just came back to her and this book was just such a beautiful book about a very strong ambitious woman who knew that she deserved more than just the status quo and was willing to go get it no matter what it took and she had a lot of guts especially during a time of racism uh the story about her house um when you read the book you'll just kind of get to understand more about racism the systemic racism behind the housing market and uh this place this book takes place during the like 60s it goes into more eras but it's mostly like the 60s and so you just, you get to know a lot about the systemic racism and those things that kind of were obstacles in her way that she still overcame. And I think it's pretty obvious, but in case I didn't say, this is a book about an African-American woman during a very obvious racial time. And I mean, it's just, it's such a beautiful book, you guys. So beautiful. Now I will say that if you have lost your mother, such as I have, or I lost a parent in general, I guess it could be a trigger either way. So just be aware if you've lost a parent and you're, um, you know, like if you were close to them, the book is a little triggering because you go through the death of both of her parents and it uh, definitely brought up feelings. And it was about three days of me reading this section of the book that was very triggering for me and my own experience with losing uh, my mother. So just putting that out there. But this is a five out of five book. Go get it. Go read it. All the books will be linked down below. I'm always really bad about saying that. But if I can find a link, I'll put it down below for you guys and go read it. I highly recommend the Fanny Davis book. All right, down to two books. The next one is called The Dance of Connection, How to Talk to Someone. Um, whoa, where'd the book go? It disappeared. I'm sorry, guys. Okay, it's got a very long title. The, the main title is The Dance of Connection, and it's written by Harriet Lerner. And the rest of it um, is how to talk to someone when you're mad, hurt, scared, frustrated, insulted, betrayed, or desperate. I gave this book a five out of five, though I could probably give it a four out of five. It's probably somewhere between a four and a five star book. And that's for a specific reason, which I'll talk about. But this book, um, and she's upfront about it. This book is about learning to communicate and giving different examples of different ways to communicate during uh, specifically hard times that maybe bring up emotional trauma for you or maybe um, dealing with a family member where you feel like you're walking on eggshells to talk to them or maybe you're dealing with your own past hurts and it's triggered in relationships like she goes over different aspects in this book of communication and dealing with those really hard emotions now she does say this book is not like this profound deep list of like 10 steps to deal with you know it's not like that kind of book it's not a uh book that's going to give you directions on how to handle something but it gives you examples it's a really great storytelling book and that's why i gave it five out of five but because it doesn't go very deep i'd say depending on what you're looking for you may not see it as a five out of five star book but i feel like the storytelling in this book is what kept me connected to it so well and so I gave it a five out of five. And there were so many examples in there that were really great and relatable, whether for me or maybe I noticed something in this book that my friends are going through or other family members. And it's so hard because like you want to tell them about this book, but you also don't want to insult them <laughs> dealing with like a very sensitive situation they're going through. Um, but I think it was a really great book and it's one of those ones I would recommend too. This was a month of really great books, guys. I'd recommend probably all these other like I said, I wasn't a fan of the one thing, but still I'd recommend it for the golden nuggets it has in it. Yes, The Dance of Connection, nothing profound, really great examples through storytelling and uh, very relatable, whether it's for yourself or someone else, you will find stories relatable in this book. So I would recommend it. And this is an author that's well known, I believe. Um, so I will be checking out more books from them. All right, the last book of this month. How many books was that? One, two, three, four, five, six. I read six books. Okay. Uh, this last book was called There's No Such Thing as Bad Weather, and it's written by Linda Ackerson McGurk. McGurk. I probably pronounced that wrong. She's of Scandinavian descent, so there are like accents and things that I can't pronounce uh, because I know nothing about the language. But 
This is a really great book. Um, the rest of the title is A Scandinavian Mom's Secret for Raising Healthy, Resilient, and Confident Kids. This book, oh my goodness, five out of five. It's only February at this point that I'm sharing books with you, but it is the best book of the year for me. The best book of the, the entire year to date. <laughs> So this book is uh, almost like a memoir style where she kind of is sharing a specific period of her life where her father became ill and she was, though she was from the Scandinavian area, she's Swedish, I think. I can't remember what specific country just off the top of my head right now, which is horrible. You think I'd remember that. But this book is about when she was living in the United States with her husband and their children and her father became ill. So she went back to where she was originally from and it's this experience of her seeing the polarizations of um how american kids are growing up versus how scandinavian kids are growing up and it has a lot to do with outside play and exploration and this book is phenomenal i feel guilty a lot of times because i don't think we get enough outside play and this book was just the push i needed I, I would agree with about 85% of the book. Some of it is extreme for me, such as letting your children sleep outside unattended. That's, that's not happening for me. Um, but this is normal where she's from. That's a normal practice, as well as leaving your children to play unattended due to um, my own experience growing up and things that have happened being a child who played unattended. Um, very scary situations happen, therefore I will not let my children play unattended. But if you haven't had those life experiences, it may not be as big of a deal for you to leave your children unattended to play. But those are the only two things I didn't agree with in the book. Everything else was amazing. Now is anything profound in this? No, no it's not. But it gives you just that push and encouragement you need to get your kids outside more and to learn to respect the earth and to have a love for it and a love for just nature and taking care of it. And I just fell in love with this book. I love the children in this book that she talks about. She talks about her children and seeing them kind of just become these new kids in this environment where outside play is encouraged. And I, I do believe that it can change so much to allow your child to play outside and to get dirty and to just explore the earth and to really get to know it compared to always being inside, playing video games, watching TV on the tablet, whatever it may be. Or even maybe you don't even let them play with electronics, but they're always inside staring out the window. I feel like this book gives clear reasons that I can agree with why it's best to let your kids be outside for hours. And since reading this book, we have been out almost every single day. I haven't been perfect. Sometimes it's just hectic and you don't get out, but we have made it a huge priority to get outside more. And when we go outside, the priority is to stay out. It's not like a five minute trip outside. Even in the winter, we had a snowstorm and it was crazy and icy and snowy everywhere. And we still played for at least 45 minutes a day outside in that snow. So, I would recommend this book. It really is a great push with just some nice little touches and methods to add to your own outside play. And we're in love with it and it's really doing things for our life. And I plan to read more on this belief of what's called free love slip. That's what they call it. That's my best attempt at saying it anyways. Yeah, five out of five. If any book at all you need to read, it's that book in the Fannie Mae Davis book or Fannie Davis book. Those two books, go get them. All right, thank you guys so much for listening for this song if you have. And if you have read any of these books, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear your opinion of any of these books. Otherwise, you will find them linked in the drop box so that you can always go check them out yourself. All right, I'll be making more videos for you guys. I'm sorry for the disappearance, but I'm back. All right, I'm back. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Have fun homeschooling. Bye.